we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hello, and welcome back once again to the Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the Barnegat Bay and the Barnegat Bay Partnership. Uh, you know, summertime is a great time of year. I think a lot about the the back bays, the creeks, and over on the shore, over on the the ocean. And uh, certainly, uh, this time of year, you know, Barnegat Bay uh, plays a pretty important role in my life and a lot of other people's lives. And uh, Karen Walzer is the uh, public outreach corner for the coordinator for the Barnegat Bay Partnership. And she's gonna talk to us today about where the Pine Barren Rivers meet the sea. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Joel. Um, I really appreciate your inviting me today and I'll just get started. I'm having a little trouble already advancing the slide. Um, so I'm Karen Walzer, uh, Public Outreach Coordinator at the Barnica Bay Partnership. Um, so first I just wanna give you a quick introduction to who we are. Um, we're a national estuary program with more than 30 partners. We all work together, together for clean water and healthy resources in the Barnica Bay. And of course it's watershed, which you know we'll get into a, just a bit later. So the National Estuary Program um, was established in 1987 through an amendment to the Clean Water Act uh, in order to protect the estuaries around our country, estuaries of national significance. So I, I love to show this map because you can see there's a big cluster of um, estuaries in the program in the Northeast and the arrows point to us, Barnegat Bay. And actually New Jersey for a small state is lucky we have three programs in our state. So besides us, it's the New York, New Jersey Harbor and also the Delaware Estuary. And each program in each estuary in the program um, develops a plan specifically to address the environmental threats within their estuary. So I, I just wanna quickly show you how many partners we have. We have a lot of partners and of course, um, the New Jersey Pinelands Commission is one of our important partners. Um, our program was actually um, nominated to become a national estuary program in 1997 by Governor Christine Todd Whitman, and we were approved in 2002. So we've had a plan in place with our partners since that time. And what it means to be a partner is um, they are actually actively involved in all the decisions that we make about how to manage the resources of the Bay and the actions we wanna to take to protect it. So now let's get into what exactly is an estuary. Um, it's a body of water where fresh water from the rivers that are draining into it mix with salt water coming in from the ocean. So this is a great animation done by Chris Kloss who works for Ocean County Parks just to show you the fresh water from a river coming in. And then the salt water coming in um, to the entryways into the Barnica Bay. And this is how it mixes. So our estuary, officially Barnica Bay Little Egg Harbor Estuary, um, was formed by sandbars, right? The barrier islands, that long line of, of sandbars um, is 42 miles long from Point Pleasant all the way down to Little Egg Harbor Inlet. It's relatively shallow for an estuary. Its average depth is only about five feet. We get fresh water coming in from 20 main tributaries and salt water comes in through three locations, Barnegat Inlet, of course, Little Egg Harbor Inlet, and also through the Point Pleasant Canal in the Northern end of the estuary. That's a man-made canal and the water comes in, salt water comes in through the Manasquan River. So what about the watershed? So no estuary would be what it is without the fresh water draining into it. And that comes from the land and we call that the watershed, the area draining to the bay. Um, all 33 towns in Ocean County are in the watershed, but also portions of four in Monmouth County, Southern Monmouth County. That's Freehold, Millstone, Howe, and Wall. Now the population in our watershed is over a half a million but that doubles to over a million during the summer. So what about the Pinelands connection to the Barnegat Bay? It's a huge connection. 
Um, this graphic on the right shows you, it's the shaded area, it will show you the portion of our watershed um, that is within the Pinelands National Reserve. So it's a considerable part. If you look at the boundary of Ocean County um, and look at that shaded area, that's over half of our watershed is within the Pinelands National Reserve. Cedar Creek, okay, is one of the tributaries that um, brings fresh, clean water into the bay. So the Pinelands, creeks, and rivers are very, very important to the health of the bay. And if you look at the photo, the vegetated area, which we call a, a riparian buffer, along the creek is shading the water and everything that lives in it, and it provides lots of healthy habitat for wildlife. It also acts like a sponge, holding and slowly releasing rainwater and preventing flooding during storms. So it moderates the flow in the creek. So this is not the only tributary um, entering the Barnegat Bay that's coming from the Pinelands. Land use um, in the watershed has changed over time. Um, the developed areas now cover over one third of the watershed. So this is a graphic, unfortunately it ends in 2001, but imagine there's a lot more red in there now um, that's come in over the, the past 10 years. Um, so, you know, looking at it, you can see a lot of that development has occurred in the northern part of the watershed, um, but it's also creeping that into the southern part. And of course, the barrier islands are, are very developed. And this is, if you think back to that, you know, nice photo of Cedar Creek, um, this area used to look like that. Um, it's in Tom's River, but this is the impact of development, like lots of roads and houses, you know, and that's important for people to live. But the um, stream going through there, um, you know, is pretty much surrounded by this development, which has impacts. So another animation, um, just to give you an idea of how these, how developing land has impacts on the water. So this is, you know, before this, you know, could be like the Cedar Creek, nice riparian buffer, vegetation all around it, healthy soil. So when it rains, um, you know, it goes right down deep into the soil and anything that flows to the nearby waterway, you know, is cleaned and filtered of pollutants on the way. And then, you know, development will come in. A lot of that vegetation gets removed and then impervious pavement comes in, the streets, the roads, the houses. Um, and of course, with all the lawns, uh, one of the things that ends up happening is we get fertilization and then, you know, it'll land on those hard surfaces or even flow to it off of lawns. And then when it rains, that gets carried in stormwater into, into the local stream or creek. And just another way of looking at it. That's the Tom's River again. Then you have to imagine all the houses, all the lawns, all the fertilizer being applied. And I'm using fertilizer as an example because that's one of the main sources of pollution in the watershed. And the bottom line is more hard surfaces equal more stormwater runoff equals more of this type of everyday people pollution that we call non-point source pollution. So clean water or green water. Um, we want water in our watershed and really throughout New Jersey to be clean for swimming, fishing, drinking, all the, all the ways that we enjoy and actually depend on water for our very life. Um, and then at the top right and bottom right, you'll see some impacts of that fertilizer we just talked about. When it is carried by stormwater and does get into the waterways, it does what it does on land, right? On land, it fuels plant growth. In water, it does the same, but it causes excessive growth of algae and phytoplankton, which will cloud the water. Um, you know, it, when it dies and decays, it can suck the oxygen out of the water and affect the, the life in there. Um, so the top is a lake in South Jersey, and the bottom is a photo someone took in the Barnegat Bay um, during an algal bloom. And these algal blooms um, actually can have some serious effects 
um, for us uh, personally, like there are lakes um, in New Jersey that are closed each summer due to harmful algal blooms when the algae is actually toxic. And then they close it, you, you can't go in to swim or boat um, during these toxic harmful algal blooms. So I mentioned in the beginning that every estuary program develops a plan and we have one. Um, the first one was in 2002 and we just revised it. So we have a new one now starting in 2021. Um, and basically it's just a long-term plan that was developed with input from the entire community and all our partners. And it outlines specific goals and actions for us to address the different issues that are impacting the Barnega Bay. And we have four main areas water quality, water supply, living resources, and land use. So these things are all connected, right? So we want to have clean water, we want to have enough water for our use and for wildlife, and we want to protect all of our wildlife and our, our habitats. And of course, that is all related to land use. So just really quickly, I'll run through the four pri priorities and at the top you can see our goal and you know it's pretty simple we want to reduce sources of pollution um, and then a couple of things that examples of what we are doing to try to reduce this pollution um, roadside filters here are, were installed in Lakewood to try to capture some of the runoff off that road and filter the pollutants out through the roots of the trees and then on the right um, you know, an example of landscaping with native plants, which also helps to reduce uh, the amount of fertilizer that can get into the bay and all of our rivers. Um, water supply, we talked a little bit about that. We wanna have lots of, of fresh water for our use and for also for freshwater flows getting into the bay because that supports the, the healthy wildlife populations in the bay. So. A little thing that people can do is install a rain barrel because that will intercept that runoff from the roof, collect it, and then it can be used in the yard for you know, watering purposes. And another example is a healthy riparian buffer. We showed that example uh, along Cedar Creek um, and mentioned that it really helps regulate the stream flow and of course protect water quality too. So in the Pinelands, um, I just want to backtrack a little bit. I don't think I mentioned that there are 15 of the 20 um, tributaries that are flowing into the Barnegat Bay pass through the Pinelands um, National Reserve. So the Pinelands is really a key um, source of fresh water for everyone who lives in the watershed, but also for the bay itself. And an important part of that is the Kirkwood Cohansee Aquifer. Um, 17 trillion gallons of water Save the source, by the way, is a campaign by Pinelands Preservation Alliance to protect the aquifer. Um, it underlies the Pinelands, including the Barnica Bay watershed. So this is one of the cleanest aquifers in America and water flowing out of the ground from the aquifer it's actually the main source, estimated about 90% of the water that flows in the rivers and creeks in the Pinelands and throughout South Jersey. Now, as I mentioned, this fresh water flowing from the Kirkwood Cohansee Aquifer into the Barnegat Bay is critical to the health of the plants and animals that live there. And not only Barnegat Bay, but also to some other estuaries in our state, Delaware Bay, Great Bay, and Great Egg Harbor Bay. Unfortunately, the aquifer is threatened just, you know, as with many of the same things that, you know, I talked about for the Barnica Bay watershed, um, pollution, but also overuse of, of the water withdrawals from the aquifer. It's just beneath the surface of the land and it's really easily polluted by fertilizers, pesticides, and other pollutants. Um, the water supply itself is under stress as an estimated 35 billion gallons is pumped from this aquifer each year. Living resources, one of our third priority, um, pretty simple, right? We wanna protect and store all the habitats in the bay and the watershed. And of course, uh, we want healthy populations of plants and animals. Um, one of the key habitats in the bay is seagrasses. 
And this is a nice photo of an eelgrass bed in Barnica Bay. Um, they have been declining uh, over the years and we're working on uh, research to understand them better and hopefully be able to restore some of these beds. That's one of our goals. And this photo on the right is showing a uh, oyster reef project um, done by Stockton University. And this group of people is actually adding to the reef some shells with oyster spat on it. And the fourth priority is land use. Um, of course, that's connect, like I said, that's connected to everything. How we use the land affects uh, the quality of our water, the amount of water we have, and the health of our habitats and, and wildlife. And um, one, one of the ways we're trying to change land use is instead of using hard um, shoreline protection things like bulkheads, um, we're trying to go more towards living shorelines and use plants to protect the upland area, but of course that will also provide habitat for wildlife. And that's a group of Powder Creek Crusaders um, enjoying one of the many open space properties preserved in Ocean County, which has been really important for the health of um, all the rivers and the bay itself. So the um, CCMP actually has eight targets and what they are, um, they're ecosystem based. So that means these are actions um, across multiple priorities. And these are things that we can monitor to measure whether we're making progress in, in protecting the bay. Um, so I just wanted to throw these up. I know it's a long list, but it, you know, it's pretty, pretty basic stuff. Like we wanna increase the number of beaches on the bay that are open for swimming and aren't closed due to public health advisories due to bacterial levels. Um, increase acreage open for shellfish harvesting, acreage, acreage of the um, seagrasses, acreage of those riparian buffers along the streams and rivers, acreage of our wetlands, increase the number of hard clams in Little Egg Harbor to approximately, approximately 200 million, um, maintain adequate water flows going to the bay and reduce the amount of water withdrawn for human use. So we touched on all those things, but these are specific targets um, and with actually more numbers, I didn't throw all the numbers in there um, associated with each of them. And this is uh, just kind of showing you how the ecosystem-based targets are not focusing on one priority. They all have connections really to uh, all four priorities. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. That's a lot of lines, but <laughs> just wanted to show you they are all connected. So the Barnaga Bay Partnership as an estuary program does do quite a bit of monitoring and research activities to better understand conditions in the bay and track um, any changes over time. So one of the big areas that we spend uh, in monitoring is water quality. Um, why do we monitor? Well, um, pretty simply put, life either thrives or dies depending on the quality of the water. Um, so the monitoring helps us, again, you know, track conditions. When we monitor, we, we are providing near real-time data. Um, and also it helps us identify maybe some areas that we need to work on to improve the water quality. So we have three stations, continuous water quality monitoring stations set up at three locations, uh, Manaloking Yacht Club, Seaside Yacht Club, and uh, Morrison's Marina in Beach Haven. And that is the link that you can go to to see the real-time data that's going from um, the monitoring station to NJDEP. And here is, uh, just I wanted to give you an idea what is at each station. So each station has a YSI data sign, and within it, there are various sensors, you can see them all sticking out there, um, that measure these uh, water quality parameters on the list. Now in Beach Haven, there are some additional uh, sent, uh, high precision sensors to measure the pH and the carbon dioxide levels in the bay. And the reason we're doing that is that um, the acidity 
of the ocean has been increasing. So we wanted to see <clears throat> you know, what was happening within Barnegat Bay and that's related to the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, it's a side effect of climate change and we wanna measure the carbon dioxide and pH levels because um, that impacts the ability of marine life to build uh, shells, bones, and other body structures made of calcium. The acidity actually dissolves that. So we wanted to see um, you know, what's actually happening within Barnegat Bay. Now, inside that box um, is all the equipment to relay or communicate the data that's being collected in near real time um, to New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And it is actually powered by a solar panel at each of the stations. <clears throat> okay, so monitoring that we do for living resources. So one thing we do is uh, seagrass monitoring because as I mentioned before, that's a key habitat in the bay. And um, these are some of our field techs. <laughs> they go out every other year um, to actually collect samples and bring back to assess the health of specific seagrass beds. This is a campaign that we've been doing, um, trying to get people um, to understand that the things that they do when they're recreating in the bay can actually harm seagrass beds. Um, so the, the graphics were developed by um, Squid Tunes, which does uh, sort of a comic format um, really, really good education um, about environmental issues. So the map on the left is showing generally the location and there are quite a few seagrass beds in Barnica Bay and over 70% of the seagrass in New Jersey is located in Barnica Bay. So it's really important to protect them. Um, seagrass provides food, shelter, and it's also a nursery ground um, for the fish and wildlife in the bay. But it also provides us, you know, our communities with some benefits. That's what the middle graphic showing you how it helps protect us, reduce erosion, um, it kind of dampens and slows down wave energy, and it helps filter the nutrients from the water. So we're encouraging people to be careful, you know, when they're boating or jet skiing, try to stay out of the seagrass bed areas as much as they can and um, you know, not anchor and drag their anchors because once these beds are scarred, um, it can take decades for them to recover. Another thing that we monitor, wetlands, right? Or salt marshes. <clears throat> Why do we monitor wetlands? Well, kind of for the same, some of the same reasons I mentioned about seagrasses is they provide uh, valuable, benefits to our communities. We call those ecosystem services, how they're helping us humans. So a short list of, you know, there's more reasons than this, but this kind of summarizes it. They really protect us from storms, um, important for um, our fisheries, recreation and tourism. Um, they, the, the grasses and the soils in the wetlands filter pollution and absorb uh, storm water like a sponge. And it's also a really excellent carbon sink, um, absorbing the, and holding the carbon from the atmosphere in the um, roots of the plants that are growing there. And just to mention, um, you know, about the storm protection, some scientific reports estimated that marshes saved $625 million in damages from Hurricane Sandy alone. That's incredible. And they, they, um, they contribute millions actually every year to our local economy. Now we're part of a group, a monitoring group um, across several states. It's called the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Wetlands Assessment. And these are some of our other partners in this effort. Um, there hadn't been really coordinated uh, monitoring of wetlands prior to this group getting together in our Northeast region. So it was established back in 2007 and they've really collected some good data. And what we do as part of that group is we, we monitor some 
uh, marshes in the Barnica Bay watershed, five sites, which help us determine um, if the marshes are keeping pace with sea level rise. We, we monitor changes in their elevation. Now the, on the left, that's, um, we have this uh, table set up um, to, that is a permanent structure out there. And we go out and, and check the level, the elevation levels of the marsh. And then in the middle and the right, you see another way we can check um, whether erosion or um, accretion or the building up of the sediment is occurring. Um, that's, we call that a marsh brownie. So some uh, felled spar was put uh, in the marsh, and then we go back and dig up a sample to see whether um, there's more sediment building on top of that or less, you know, it's eroded away. In 2020 alone, just to give you a statistic, we collected over 500 measurements from these elevation tables and from uh, the marker horizon plots, which is the marsh brownies. Another thing that the uh, researchers do in the wetlands to track their health is to <clears throat> do assessments of the habitat. And um, these are just some of the things that they do when they're out there. They check for the percentage of invasive species, what's growing there, um, how thick the coverage is, and what's the bearing capacity of the soil. Another um, it's a citizen science project that we do in association with um, our wetlands research is called Paddle for the Edge. Um, over the past six years, we've had over 400 volunteers help us paddle a total of 125 miles of bay shoreline. They use a smartphone app to collect the data and we have uh, 6,568 data locations that have been uh, collected. The information that they gather for us helps us assess the current condition of the shoreline, whether, you know, there is wetlands there, is it eroding, you know, is it, is it increasing, um, all those types of things. They take a photo and they collect some basic data. And it helps us identify, you know, potential locations for some restoration projects. <clears throat> the bottom line about wetlands is they are at risk. Um, so we have all these uh, challenges and stresses on them. Um, sea level rise is covering um, some of them. Flooding, uh, erosion from high intensity storms, nor'easters, um, hurricanes. <clears throat> we often have a rapid loss, loss of shoreline. And these losses impact not only the habitat that they provide, but also water quality since they do filter um, and kind of control the flow of water. The problem is with the wetlands, you know, when they are eroded along the edge, often on the Western side, there are roads and houses and development. <clears throat> so they're not actually able to grow in that direction and build up with sediment. So that's why we are challenged with these wetland losses. And this map uh, shows us that they are mostly severely stressed um, from the assessments that we've done at all these sites. The red is severely stressed, the yellow moderately stressed. So it really is only a few um, that we've assessed that are not under stress. And they are, as you can see, in the Southern uh, less developed uh, part of the watershed uh, down by the Tuckerton area. Um, so the development in the northern part of the watershed, you can see that that's definitely impacting uh, the health of the wetlands. Another uh, type of research that we do um, for living resources is we do a juvenile fish and jellyfish population study. Um, we go saming at 15 bay locations from May to October and then see what we catch, count and measure, um, so that is really tracking any changes in the, in the populations. And we are seeing um, some changes due to uh, climate change increasing the water temperatures. We're seeing more uh, southern species extending their range north into Barnegat Bay, 
examples of that are uh, skillet fish and silver perch and mullet. And also less uh, numbers in some northern species that were already at their most southern extent of their range. And now as the water temperature warms, they're moving north. So an example of that is the black sea bass. So this gives us kind of valuable information about the state of the populations and also what's happening with climate change. Another monitoring that we do is the populations of American eels. Um, we have since 2012 monitored their passage back into the Barnica Bay watershed. Uh, juvenile eels um, end up uh, coming in around uh, the beginning of, of February. Um, overall, there are low populations of American eel up and down the Atlantic coast. Uh, one of the things that's uh, blocking their movement back upstream are dams. So now there's a movement to re remove some of these dams so that they have free passage. And of course, that's not only for eels, but other fish species as well. So uh, just a little background on eels. They are diadromous, which means they move between freshwater and seawater. But unlike salmon, which are anadromous, which means they spawn in freshwater and live most of their lives in the ocean, eels are exactly the opposite. They are catadromous, meaning they spawn in the ocean and live as adults in freshwater rivers and streams. So like I mentioned, starting in February, the juvenile eels are migrating from the ocean areas where they spawned back into the freshwater streams and rivers of the Barnica Bay. And that's where they will mature as adults. So it's a pretty low tech method that we have for monitoring the eels. Um, you could see our collectors, which volunteers constructed for us uh, using shredded rope and uh, plant their bottoms and, and they weave it through there. We place these in streams and that's what the eels like to go and hide in. And that's how we collect them. Uh, the map shows you the different sites uh, that we do it at the dam at Lake Shenandoah, another dam at Kettle Creek, and also on Long Swamp Creek and on the Forked River uh, at the site of the Park Avenue Dam. So during the past years, you can see how many we collected. Uh, we captured th th over 31,000 eels. And then what we do, uh, besides counting them, is we take um, a sample of them back to our lab and we identify their life stage by looking at them under the microscope. So that's the bottom photo there. These are glass seals, very young. They're actually transparent. Um, and the markings tell us how old they are. And to do that, you have to knock them out with a tranquilizer for a brief time um, so that they stay still. And then all of the eels are returned um, to the sites where we collected them. Another living resource project is something that we funded um, Stockton University and other partners, they are doing um, an oyster reef restoration at Tuckerton. Um, it's called the Tuckerton Reef. And this is showing you them, you know, putting some of the shell um, that the oysters need to attach to um, down in, at the site of the reef. Now this already has spat attached to it. They do that on land and then they place it at the reef. So they are um, actually now the reef has been in place for a couple of years. So they are assessing um, what fish and invertebrate um, use of the reef is. So once you put down these oysters, many other uh, marine life come in, attach to it, swim through it, similar to a coral reef. And they're also collecting water quality data to try to understand if these oyster reefs are having an impact on uh, clean water in the bay. Are they fil helping to filter it and remove some of the nutrients? Um, you know, a, everyone has probably heard the statistics that a, one oyster can actually filter 50 gallons of water every single day. So we kind of talked about the, the research, the problems, the research going on. And I always like to end with, um, well, what can we do? And we can actually do a lot. So what the Barnica Bay Partnership um, did was start a new initiative called Jersey Friendly Yards. 
and we partner with Rutgers Cooperative Extension and the Ocean County Soil Conservation District. We're trying to get the word out to people through a website, which is jerseyyards.org, and also educational programs, webinars, and projects about uh, what you can do in your own landscaping that will help um, make your yard not only healthier, but also um, all the rivers, the entire watershed and Barnica Bay healthier. So the, the website actually goes through eight steps to having uh, Jersey friendly and Bay friendly landscape. Um, and they're pretty, pretty basic steps, right? Start out planning, um, have healthy soil, get your soil tested, conserve water. A lot of the water that's wasted um, in, in our watershed is outside. And this is true nationwide. Um, about 50% of the water that's used on landscapes is, is, is wasted and runs off and carries pollutants. Use less fertilizer, um, use less pesticides. If you can, take out a little bit of lawn and put in some native plants instead and reduce, reuse, and recycle. So on the website, you know, if, you, if you go check it out, and hopefully you will, um, there's a feature called the interactive yard. And it kind of runs through the steps in an interactive way. You can build a new landscape, starting with this kind of generic, basic uh, New Jersey landscape yard, you know, a couple of trees, a couple of flower beds, but a lot of lawn. <clears throat> After you go through the steps, um, you've really transformed it into a much more environmentally friendly lawn. And the idea of it is to you know, give you ideas, not that you're gonna do all of this. Um, and then you can really see that where the lawn was taken out and some uh, flower beds were added in, trees, shrubs um, are on the edges of the property. And that really does help to capture water that might be running off and reduce any pollution that might be coming off the yard due to fertilizer use. Um, you know, it's, we're not saying remove all the lawn, just, you know, if you can remove some of it and put these, uh, these beds along the edges of the property that really goes a long way to help reduce pollution. <clears throat> the website also has a really awesome searchable plant database that you can use to, um, find the plants um, that are eco-friendly and will fit the conditions in your yard. So you have to do a little assessment, <clears throat> see how much light your area gets, um, hopefully get a soil test or at least know what kind of soil you have um, and it helps you pick the plants that will meet your requirements, including if you wanna attract wildlife and maybe you have to uh, you know, have drought friendly plants or you know, wanna resist deer. And of course, education is a big part of what we do, which is why we have programs like this. Um, but also we have a lot of information on our website. Um, easy to remember, barnicabaypartnership.org. Um, we have a really nice database of Barnica Bay species. So if you see something and you don't know what it is, or you have questions, or you just want to check it out. Um, and of course, I already mentioned the Jersey Yards website to help um, everyone do a little better in their own yard because Actually, the main sources of pollution are coming from everywhere. So every little bit helps if you can do something. Um, we have a nice newsletter, the Barnica Bay Beat, which you can sign up for. And of course, we have various webinar series, Ask a Barnica Bay Scientist, um, where scientists will discuss their research and what they're finding. And also we have a series of Jersey Friendly Arts webinars. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me anytime at my email. All right. Well, Karen, that was a really great program. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed how you explained the interconnectedness of everything, how what happens upstream in the Pine Barrens certainly affects Barnegat Bay. You know, it's really neat to see that whole cycle. And then I also thought it was very interesting when you talked about the different tangible things that you're measuring to protect the bay. And then in the end, it with how we can all have an effect, I think is great. So that was really the complete circle. Now, we always think about the pine lands as water, water everywhere, and it truly does. What happens in the Pine Barrens has a great effect on Barnegat Bay, 
and vice versa. You know, the wetlands on the bay and the shorelines, if they're not there, that's going to affect the pine land. So it's really an interconnected system and a great job pointing that out for us today. Thank you. Yeah, I always... I, I really enjoy finding those connections. And I think, I think we all realize it, but sometimes it's nice to just uh, kind of get that reinforced, right? That we all depend on each other. And we, Barnegat Bay like, is, is a product of the Pinelands, the clean water in the Pinelands, rivers and aquifers. So we are totally dependent on that. Right. Yep. Yeah, and, and the eels are an amazing species. I mean, way deep in the Pine Barrens, many, many times we found eels. And it's just neat to see them as just such a great example of an animal that spends time in the ocean and in the uplands and uh, how important those resources are. Exactly. Yeah, I've seen them. I live in the upper, very upper part of the watershed in Jackson and I have seen eels here. So it is amazing. They're amazing creatures. Yep. I know there was around 20 folks watching. So, uh, this number is up. If anyone has questions for Karen, now would be a great time to call in. Um, we'll keep the number up here for a little while just to give everybody an opportunity. Um, you know, you're very fortunate if you live in southern New Jersey to have both of these great resources, to have the, the Pine Barrens on the inland side and then to have Barnegat Bay on the, the ocean side. Uh, it's just a, a great place to live. And uh, like Karen said, we can make an impact. We can take better care of it. And uh, long term, you know, the better care we take of the land, the better the land's going to take care of us. And uh, at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. I agree. A hundred percent. I'm sure the listeners do too. Yep. I've uh, been very fortunate to, to partner with the Barnegat Bay Partnership over the years. And uh, like Karen said, it's, it's one thing to um, quantify what's going on in the Bay, but it's really important to have those tangible results to see if we are making an impact. And then, you know, both me and Karen work in education. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about, is getting that message to the people that can make a difference. And that's why it's so important for everybody to understand how interconnected everything is and uh, where we can start to make decisions that are gonna ultimately put it in a better, more sustainable position for the future. And uh, that really draws upon a lot of other things, but that's really what it's all about is maintaining and preserving uh, these habitats and systems for us and the wildlife going forward in the future. Yep, absolutely. And that's really the, um, the reason that we have a plan and we, we need a plan is that we have this all spelled out what we, um, actions we wanna take to try to improve things. And then we you know, try to measure it through research or through our education programs if we are making any progress. Okay. And we have a call. All right. Hello, you're live on the air with your question. Uh, hi, yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, Karen, um, do the communities that are along the, um, at the edge of the, of the Barnegat Bay, do they seem to want to em embrace these um, environmentally sound practices, or do you find a lot of resistance with uh, some of the municipalities? Right. I think... Um... I think they want to do the right thing. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a matter of budgets. But one thing I didn't I, mention, I which I should uh, have, is that recently the DEP um, kind of restructured their stormwater um, requirements so that the first um, thing that any project in a municipality um, has to do to try to manage stormwater is through what's called green infrastructure. So they are supposed to try these nature-based solutions first, such as rain gardens, bioswales, permeable pavement, all of those things, <clears throat> which was you know, more optional before. Now it's become a requirement to, to manage stormwater in this way rather than the traditional, um, you know, send it through a pipe to a stream, um, send it to a detention basin. Let, let's try to, to manage it, get it right back into the soil. 
on the actual site that's generating the stormwater and, and treat it that way. So that's a huge development actually for, um, for water supply and water quality. The more you get it back into the soil, it'll replenish the aquifer and also it'll get cleaned right away and not carry that pollution um, off to the stream or river. So, um, oh, and I think okay. so that the, towns are embracing that, you know, I mean, they have to, <laughs> but you know. Yeah, it, right. it's, yeah. A, it's a state mandate now. So yes. they have to do that. So they have that, they have a good basis for adding some of these other um, initiatives to, you know, further uh, use, you know, the envir environmentally sound practices, um, take them farther. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I just want to say it, it's, it's promising. Like, I think towns are, are trying to do, I can name uh, a couple, well, one in particular is at Pine Beach, which is on the Toms River. Um, they installed um, at one of their parks, it's actually right on the river, they re-landscaped okay. it and put native plants in there. Um, you know, they're, they're trying, they're trying to do um, think the things that they can, but I think a lot of times it just comes down to, to funding. Yeah. Um, I, I live in Point Pleasant Borough and I was wondering how they are. Well, I, I've only been here. Well, I actually grew up here, but just lived away many years and just recently came back a year and a half ago. Um, and with the pandemic, you know, things are kind of uh, helter yeah. skelter. But um, yeah, I'm wondering how they are doing in terms of protecting the bay. Do you have any, um, do you know any information about Point Pleasant or um, just off the top the of the head? The only thing, I do know they have a very active environmental commission. Um, so oh, as a, mm -hmm. you know, returning resident, I would I would always recommend getting involved. I think the more that the residents attend mm -hmm. uh, meetings and, and learn what's going on and express their opinions, <clears throat> I think that really helps um, right. kind of right. push now towns that, in the right direction. So, you know, now that they're hopefully, you know, getting more organized and opening up more um, for public, uh, you know, participation. Yeah, it has, and it's hard with, with COVID. I know, I know some towns did, did have hold virtual meetings, but it's not quite the right. same. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, maybe I've done some of that, but I haven't really gotten involved with the town, but I, I would like to, you know, I'd like to uh, know more about what they're doing and right. you know, where they stand on these environmental right. and, issues. And just to mention, um, it, it's not quite ready yet because we're still working on it, but we um, did get a grant from uh, DEP to start uh, a new stewardship certification program for the Barnica Bay watershed. And what that will oh. do is um, enable residents to um, be certified uh, Jersey friendly yards, also schools, there'll be a program for schools that they can um, learn about it and do some things in their schoolyard um, to make it more environmentally friendly. And there'll be a program mm -hmm. for municipalities too, um, that things that they can do just, pretty much exactly what you're talking about, you know, maybe putting in more um, optional um, things, you know, green infrastructure, um, rain gardens, uh, you know, being more conscious of fertilizer applications, uh, kind of adopting integrated pest management techniques, all of those things that relate back to how they're treating their landscape. Um, so once that's launched, hopefully we'll get some buy-in from municipalities in, in the watershed. Yeah, I hope so. And yeah, and I'm sure if they have residents that are standing behind these initiatives, that'll be a more motivation for them you know, to to embrace them. Exactly. You know, hopefully. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll just say I don't. I think Joel would agree with me that over the the past few years, we see kind of a see like really hopeful signs, like kind of of a change in more people becoming aware of, you know, the harm that, um, you know, using chemicals in your yard and, um, you know, just kind of understanding that and trying to do more about it. Like there's a tremendous increase in native plants over the last few years and using them in landscaping. So yeah, I, I, I see hopeful signs. 
Yeah, people are becoming more aware and wanting to do exactly. know, what's best, hopefully, for the ecosystem. Exactly. I think I think all the the various um, challenges with climate change is is also increasing people's awareness too. Mm-hmm. Like after Hurricane Sandy, there was a tremendous increase in um, interest in you know how can I re landscape my yard which was flooded by Sandy so that you know it will be more resilient you know should we get another uh, storm so that was very interesting. I just want to mention I I think one thing that the pandemic lockdown did for a lot of people was help them to focus more on nature and become more aware of it, become more closer to it because, you know, they're basically doing everything from the home. So in order to get out and do something, I think a lot of people started discovering or rediscovering natural areas. So um, I think in that sense, that, that, might have sort of helped uh, open up more awareness about some of these environmental problems as yes. well. I agree. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah, All yeah, right, me too. I mean, it was a tough time to get through for everybody, but there definitely was some silver linings. And uh, just like the caller said, that ability to kind of get back to nature to kind of, especially if you're all by yourself and you really had more of an opportunity to, uh, you know, feel the presence of the ecosystems and environment around us. Uh, and I agree with Karen. I do think it's very positive. I think there's a lot of momentum. You know, all the towns and the shore, they're uh, economically viable because of the shore, because of the bay. And, uh, and, you know, ultimately they realize that without those resources, that's going to be very dire economic consequences. So the steps with stormwater, anything they can do to better position themselves for a sustainable future, uh, particularly after Sandy and and see the rise, uh, there's a definitely heightened awareness of uh, you know planning for the future because we know things are changing. And uh, you know, like Karen said in the, in the program a couple of times, it's really about how we position ourselves so we are sustainable um, to be able to continue to live in this great place and kind of have that balance between uh, economics and nature and, uh, and the kind of where it all comes together. Exactly. That's those ecosystem services I mentioned, they actually have a monetary value. Um, economists estimate that. We had a study done um, a few years ago where an economist <clears throat> kind of pulled together the, the numbers and estimated that the Barnegat Bay and everything associated with it um, actually generates $4 billion a year um, for the economy. So that's huge. Yeah, you know, the, that's the reality of the world. We, we all, we love nature, we love ecology, but at the end of the day, the, a lot of things are driven by the bottom line and the yep. economic viability. And that's just the things that you have to take into consideration. Um, it's all part of, you know, I, I wanna say it again, because it's really the, one of the most important things is to sustain us for the future. Uh, it all really all comes back together from the water, from the, the water in the aquifer that feeds the estuaries for the estuaries, for the small fish, for the big fish, for the eelgrass. I mean, it really is just one big circular cycle. And uh, we know we have an impact. And at, in the future, it's going to be up to us. Are we going to have a positive impact or are we going to have a negative impact? And with all this education, it's definitely very clear, hopefully for many people, uh, what the the negative side can be. And uh, hopefully that's very strong influence for people to make uh, those decisions to you know, be more sustainable uh, going forward. All right, well, we've uh, had some time. Uh, I see Karen has her email up. Uh, for any folks that are gonna watch this live and gonna watch it later on, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email Karen um, at her email address, which is there. Also, feel free to email me at the Pinelands Commission. Our uh, email is info um, at pinelands.nj.gov, and uh, we're glad to help you. Um, Barney Bay Partnerships, like Jersey Friendly, has got a, yards, has got a great amount of resources, and they're really there to be as a resource and help people figure these th- things out, and uh, the Pinelands Commission is as well. So please feel free to reach out, and if you have questions, we're always happy to ha- help happy and um, looking forward to help you. All right. All right. Thanks, Joel, for having me today. 
Oh, yeah, Karen, thank you very much. And on that note, I think I'm going to uh, shut down the live broadcast.